All right, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. And good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. Um, my name is Megan Kolner. I serve on the board of directors at ITAD as the non-executive director. Uh, and we're very, very pleased to have you join us today for the first of three events um, in our series um, that ITAD is convening to talk about um, how monitoring, evaluation, and learning professionals and activities need to change to better serve the complexity, scale, and urgency of crises facing the world today. We're bringing together top minds working across funding and implementing organizations to talk about evalu evaluator competencies, practices, and approaches required to advance system change, everything from stopping and preventing conflict, reversing extreme economic inequality, combating pandemics, and even saving the planet. We hope these discussions in our panel series will challenge how we all work as MEL professionals um, and practitioners, um, everything from how we confront power imbalances to political economy analysis to understanding and nuancing complex variables. Uh, today with our fine panelists, we'll be focusing on the MEL localization agenda, um, as we know, working with large, complex, and emergent situations places even greater emphasis on the need for local leadership analysis and solutions. Yet, there are also many ways that the existing aid and development systems are structured that have stymied localization efforts, or in some of the worst cases, have tokenized contributions from local actors. Our panelists have unique insights on the evaluation landscape and are actively promoting localization in MEL using the tools at their disposal from their various roles in the system. ITAD is committed to facilitating a greater shift to localization of MEL practice. Um, we want to see MEL practice designed, undertaken, and disseminated by the populations in which development programs are delivered. We've committed to this as one of our core priorities in the 2022 through 2025 strategic plan. And we still have a lot to learn about this topic from our partners, from what others are doing, and, and hopefully from folks here today on the call. Uh, we definitely don't always get this right um, and have missed opportunities in the past to uh, advance this agenda forward. So we certainly aren't here to claim we have all the answers. We're eager to learn um, and continue our own learning, and we hope today's discussion and the panelists' blogs spark learning for others, too. Um, it's important to recognize this isn't the first one of these conversations um, about localization in our sector, uh, so we're hoping to dive into real practical examples and experiences to enable better equitable partnership development and localization efforts in MEL. Uh, in order to have plenty of time for Q&A for everyone on the call to get involved, um, panelists have shared a couple of blogs in advance with an extended snapshot of their ideas. You can check them out on the event page on ITAD's website, on LinkedIn or Twitter, or um, I think they'll also be posted in the chat shortly. Um, I'll be handing over my mic shortly to uh, the first of our esteemed panelists. Um, the panelists will speak for four minutes or for five minutes each together. Um, and after hearing their initial remarks uh, from the panelists, they'll sort of will take 15 minutes to have them respond to one another's statements and ideas before we open it up to Q&A from the group. Um, our friend Neil at ITAD will be helping us to moderate the chat um, and uh, which we hope you use to bring up discussion points or to ask questions to the panelists. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to unmute you all individually, so hopefully you don't mind my performing your question in front of everyone. I'll do my best. If you can help Neil and I out by um, including in your question whether you want to uh, target a specific panelist, that would be really helpful. So I think with that, that is all of our housekeeping taken care of. Um, and I'll be handing it over to our first panelist, um, D uh, David Enya, who uh, will uh, share more about his work um, and his experiences in this space. David, over to you. Thank you very much, Megan. And uh, we are so happy to have Oh, my screen, I can see about 100, almost 100 people in this event today. My name is David Amaya. I'm the president and CEO of the International Center for Evaluation and Development. 
Uh, it's, a, it's an Africa-based, African-led think and do tank, focusing purposely on the research, monitoring, and evaluation with our headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya, and the West Africa office in Accra. And uh, we operate in about 22 countries in Africa with emerging international partnership that ranges from major donors, philanthropic organization, foundations, and other organizations and other institutions. I'm so happy that I can be here today talking, up, talking about localizing, monitoring, and evaluation and learning, because that is what ICE is for. ICE was established in 2017 to take monitoring and evaluation to focus on global south. How can we have nonprofits, evidence-based, evidence-informed, evidence generation think tank that can purposefully and sorry focus on localizing monitoring and evaluation in global south. And that is how it was, you know, the institution was formed. Previously, I've worked in different parts of the world. I have done monitoring and evaluation in almost more than 90 countries around the world, you know, starting from Millennium Challenge Corporation in Washington, DC, and spending some time in Agra, you know, in, in, in Africa. And, and, and the challenge was that MNE was becoming so falling to local based institutions. MNE, like any other falling and, you know, uh, uh, development initiative, you know, comes in and it is becoming more of an extraction instead of a learning uh, uh, a process where it can really benefit all the stakeholders along a program value chain. So, you know, when we talk about MNG, I have about five main functions of monitoring and evaluation and learning, because if we don't understand it, then it becomes a challenge. So in eyes, we see about five functions or six functions of monitoring, ev evaluation, and learning. What do we do MNG and learning? First, to ensure that interventions and inve investments are in line with a strategy or program objective and goals. So whether you are, it's a policy, whether it's a program, whether it's a, it's a project, the first function of MNG or MER is to ensure that what is happening and the investment, whether it's an input, whether it's a process, whether it's an output, whether it's an outcome, or whether it's an impact, is in line with the main purpose, goals, and, and objective of the program. Second, the main purpose function of MNG or MER is to assess the outcome and impact of a program, project, and policy to determine whether they have been achieved cost effectively and efficiently. You know, when I get time, I will define when we say effective and efficient, what do we mean? The third, to capture the progress, success, and failure of a program policy, intervention, or even an institution. Four, to inform management and program officers and stakeholders on strategic planning and risk management. And maybe one of the things that most organizations have focused on is the fifth function, which I put it as last but one function. It's not the core function, is one of the function is to provide accountability to stakeholders. And you see most monitoring and evaluation focus on this one, but not the main function of MNG accountability. 
The last one that I have here is to use MEL to contribute to knowledge management and convening for the scale up of successful model and approaches. I've spent so many years working in Africa. And all the time, the question I ask myself is, is my monitoring and evaluation performing this six basic functions? If they are not performing it, then it becomes an extraction more than a process for learning. So when, when you look at definition, and Carol, let me see you smiling if my time is up. You know, <laughs> because your smile will let me know the time. You know, so when you look at the function of monitoring and evaluation, we define it as a continuous, you know, process of systematically collecting data to inform stakeholders about progress being made. And when we talk about stakeholders, you will see that the six main functions I've talked about are prior. So when we talk about localization, I'm talking about, are we making sure that the interventions are in line? Are we making sure that we are assessing the outcome and impact to determine the effectiveness and efficiency? Are we capturing progress? Are we informing stakeholders to make decisions? Are we providing accountability? And are we contributing to knowledge and convening that will help us to scale up successful model and approaches? Thank you. Thank you so much, David. We'll come back to you later for some more insights. Let's yes. hand it over now uh, to Marika Hunyat, uh, who is the Director of Effective Philanthropy at Porticus Foundation. Thanks, Marika. Thanks a lot, Megan. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'll also thanks to some of you who've introduced yourself on the chat. It's nice to get a sense of who's in the room. Um, otherwise, it feels a little bit lonely here uh, with the camera on. Um, uh, I already shared a few thoughts in a uh, blog post leading up to this event, which I thought was a very clever way of ITAT to make sure I come a little bit prepared uh, here today. Um, so I really support the setup. Uh, I will not take a lot of airtime because I know we have a lot of expertise in this virtual space. Um, and I really look forward to hearing from many of the people um, who are joining. Um, when it comes to sort of biggest challenges and opportunities, which is something that uh, Megan and ITAD colleagues asked me to sort of focus on in these five minutes, is um, regarding the localization agenda. I just thought maybe I'll just start with the opportunity side. Um, because, of course, we all know that the most dreaded scenario for an evaluator is that a report or findings are like filed nicely on some sort of virtual shelf uh, and are of little relevance or consequence to every anyone who has been involved in the work. And I suppose this is actually still quite a benign scenario. I mean, of course, we also have a potential scenario where the people involved feel a sense of disempowerment about how monitoring, evaluation and learning has been uh, undertaken. Um, so I think the real opportunity is to try and prevent uh, some of this practice and to really live up to some of the standards that um, that David has nicely outlined already. Um, we all know that if MEL is actually owned by the parties involved, the quality of the data is not only better, but it can also actually really be uh, utilized and useful. Um, so what really stands out for me is ownership uh, and that uh, and that idea of ownership is not per se so clear cut, um, because what is local ownership uh, really? Uh, and maybe some of you who are joining today can share a few thoughts on this, because what, what I'm thinking about is uh, that localization really means that it needs to be, um, it needs to take into consideration what the people who are concerned with work and 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 that locality really value instead of again coming up with some sort of paradigm on defining localization from a lens that might not be um, shared otherwise we are just sort of repeating the inequity in how we make decisions or how we define partnerships um 
So just to challenge a little bit, I think sometimes people really value and relish an outsider perspective uh, or someone with a very specific set of expertise. Uh, I remember years ago working with a Kenyan colleague who had uh, in, in the Philippines, uh, who had tremendous experts uh, in evaluating uh, water and sanitation type work. And that was so useful um, to, to people there that, you know, this question didn't even really come up. So, um, and the other thing I want to say is sometimes someone who, like I am based in Amsterdam, what I consider uh, local is, is not per se shared in other parts of the world and people in that locality might not consider that local at all. Um, so I just, I thought I'd just throw in a couple of thoughts here. Uh, the five minutes came quicker as I thought Megan is showing up on the screen. Um, the, other, the other one word I will still throw out there that I think we can maybe come back to in the discussion is the idea around power because I think that's something we find quite difficult to talk about. Whereas I think if we can find graceful ways to talk about power, I think that will be really helpful in this discussion. So really looking forward to hearing some practical suggestions from everyone and um, thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Marika. You're the only one for whom five minutes passes quickly, but we really appreciate it. We hear you at Kelsey Rachel and Lurser at Ford Foundation. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, thanks, Megan. And sorry, I think my uh, audio cut out for a second. So I hope you all can hear me. Um, and I can't see the chat either. So uh, maybe some technical difficulties on my end, but we'll try to keep uh, to five minutes. So first, just a quick thank you for uh, to ITAD for facilitating this conversation and for inviting us at Ford to join. I'm here with my colleague, Savarna Mathis, who's also on the call, um, and five minutes will go quickly. Um, but before I dive into the opportunities and challenges, just wanting to situate a little bit of where Ford sits in this conversation, because I do think it's a little bit different um, than some others who might be on this call in the international development landscape. And I think it is also um, brings up what localization means for a large private philanthropy who's mostly doing advocacy um, and policy change, sometimes at national and state levels in a variety of different contexts. Um, so just to say that what I'll focus on a little bit today is, is how the opportunities and challenges we're seeing internally and how we're trying to change um, in our own work at Ford. Um, but also did want to mention that um, we've also been, and some of you might have seen, commissioning uh, a landscape analysis over the past year um, that to really look and better understand the current state of affairs related to localization, um, what we often call equity-oriented evaluation methodologies, um, anything that is looking to shift power and to uh, right-size a lot of wrongs that have been um, going on within the monitoring, evaluation, and learning community um, for the past 50 plus years since it really started. Um, and some of our partners are also on the call today. So just wanted to say, we hope to share some of those insights and add to this conversation uh, in the coming months um, as to what we're seeing and, and what people are trying and what is and isn't working and what are some of the potentially unintended um, positive and negative impacts of some of the work that has been coming out from a variety of different donors um, and organizations. Um, so at Ford, just to say, we um, our Office of Strategy and Learning only started seven years ago, which means that we've only been doing monitoring, evaluation, learning for about three to four years, because the first bit of that was around really creating strategies. Um, I think that at Ford, our North Star is on addressing the drivers of inequality. And so when our office was set up to um, create an Office of Strategy and Learning. My colleagues, again, uh, Sabarna and Bess uh, Rothenberg, um, really thought about what does that mean for uh, putting into place processes and practices that um, recognize existing power dynamics and continue to ask the question, to what end, for whom, and by whom? Um, and so I think where we've seen some opportunities just in, again, we're in a journey and continue to learn from everyone on this call, but is actually in some of the more um, boring or not sexy parts, um, which is refining our RFP process, which I can get more into looking to get the, the information further out to um, evaluators that are not the 
the typical and that actually do uh, have lived experience in the in the communities we're working on um, and with um, and to really just get to some of those um, kind of uh, nitty gritty aspects of, of really what does an RFP process look like and and what does then the evaluation that comes after that look like um, that continues to, to center uh, principles of localization and equity. Um, I didn't have time, I see Megan, to get to some of the, the challenges of which there are many, but hopefully in the conversation um, we can dive into that. The last point I'll just make for us, the biggest challenge in thinking about localization is because we do evaluations at a portfolio level, not grant by grant evaluations or project by project evaluations, it's often thinking about what does localization mean across 200 plus grantees that are working across a, a large context, again, mostly on advocacy and policy and not as much on direct service provision. So how do you still ensure community voice at the right level to get the right input that's not just being extractive and checking a localization box, but is actually, um, useful both for us, but also for, for the community. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Kelsey. We'll definitely tune back into you later to hear more about some of those challenges and also, you know, any of the lessons in your, how you're conducting these RFP processes. Um, let's hand it over to James Robinson, who's an associate partner at ITAD. James, over to you. Uh, thanks, Megan, and well, thanks uh, to, to all the panellists as well. It's some really great stuff to get us started uh, today. Um, so, and welcome to, to everyone joining us online. Um, as Megan said, I'm an associate partner at ITAD. Um, I lead our inclusive growth and climate change practice, uh, and I'm working with um, a group of colleagues to, to push forward um, our export partnerships work as part of the new ITAD strategy. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to reiterate a couple of things that um, Megan said at the beginning that, you know, recognising that ITAD is, is definitely on a, a learning journey here um, and we're um, be just beginning to think through how we can effectively play um, a role um, and it's part of the reason that we're organising this, um, this panel today. Um, and you know, as um, practitioners, our main way of kind of influencing this this agenda is through the teams that we convene and how we conduct our project work. Um, so my uh, examples around challenges and uh, opportunities are focused on that. Um, so in terms of uh, some of those challenges. Um, linked to, to what Kelsey uh, was saying, actually. Um, one of the things that, that we see is that um, tension between when we are um, evaluating global global programmes and we're looking at, um, you know, complex um, global, um, yeah, programmes that are looking to, um, to intervene in, in in complex problems and there can be a tension um, in you know balancing you know all aspects that an evaluation is um, is looking at um, and including yeah bringing in like locally um, led perspectives you know, and as I said that can be in a, a large variety of, of geographic regions and yeah bal balancing that is is something that that is a challenge and something that we see um, is is thought through at, at many different levels and you know quite often uh in the, the terms of reference and, and rfps that we see that that you know there can be quite um a variety of different approaches to that and you know some of those are, are quite directive um and you know with with times allocated to certain um you know case studies etc as well so that's one of the the challenges that, that we see and there are more um I mentioned some in in the blog that I wrote. Um, in uh, that I can see Carol just popped in the, in the chat. I, I also talked a little bit about some of the internal challenges that that we have at ITAD as well. Um, and also recognising that um, there's a lot of really great thinking um about this out there as well. And oh no, Megan's popped up. So the oh, but again, I don't want to um. I, I don't want to stop talking before I talk about um opportunities because you know that's part of the reason that we're here today. Um. And, and in thinking about this beforehand, I was thinking that, you know, that one of the greatest opportunities is, is really around technology and how I feel that it's actually like facilitating the shifts that we're, we're talking about today. You know, obviously, as a, today is a good example for, from our point of view, like um, bringing people together, collaborating, bringing um, different voices into analysis has never been uh, easier. Um, you know, there are still challenges, but, you know, there it, it, it's getting easier. And 
you know that's in terms of the way that we run our teams but also um in in bringing in different voices into the um into evaluations and, and analysis and yeah there's there's a lot of really interesting work out there that i now won't speak about because i've gone over my time over to you Thanks, James. This creeping in on panelists as they're talking, I think is a good strategy. So hopefully we take notes for the future. <laughs> um, but thank you to all of our panelists for um, really great and, and you know, disparate uh, sort of reflections on uh, localization and MEL. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to invite the four of you to respond to, you know, any comments that you all made or you know anything i have a couple to direct us if you're not ready but i just wanted to invite the four of you if you want to hop in and ask each other a question or sort of capitalize on a point that someone was making david i see you ready i'm gonna ask you to join in <laughs> okay i can see yes uh you know one of the things and i'm reading the chats here you know, and uh, I've listened to, you know, uh, Casey and James and uh, and Mariki. You know, one of the things that uh, maybe it will maybe another question, but it has bothered me a lot. Is at times when we talk about localization, you know, we are talking about the process of actually conducting the evaluation, the equity, the power, you know, who is involved and who is doing it, you know. But my biggest concern here is more on the utilization than even the commission, because I've seen evaluation that have been done by Global South professionals. But when the evaluation was done, it went up. You know, I've been invited to Washington DC, London, Copenhagen and other places where evaluations that have been done in Africa, the results are being presented over there. And the question I sit down is, who is it for? Is it for the people that the intervention was done and it was evaluated? What benefit has come to them? So to me, when we talk about localization, I want to take the aspect of who and who is doing it to who and who is benefiting from it. You know, it's not having a bunch of, you know, Africans or Asians or indigenous people conducting the evaluation, but what is the use of the evaluation for the man? I, you know, I want to say this thing. We said MNE doesn't have inherent value. The value of MNE comes from the use and utilization of the fundings. You know, so it's not a matter of who is doing it, but who is benefiting from it. That is the refreshing I would like to, you know, bring up here. Thanks, David. And that underscores some points we're seeing in the chat. Um, I know we have someone from the Movement for Community-Led Development, um, for instance, talking about, you know, how, who, uh, who is going to receive the information on the other side? Who is this for? So thank you for underscoring that. Uh, what about any of our other panelists? Any sort of responses either to what David just shared or to one another's um, opening remarks? If not, I have questions ready. Don't worry. Well, I can I can jump in, um, Megan. I think David, thank you. I think this is this is the the point. I think right. I think we as a field aren't always doing this very well yet, and I and I think that this should be part of the discussion. Uh, and what do we need to change in our practice so that? Um, the, yeah, that people can really feel part of this and can feel um, that is relevant to, to them and have that sense of ownership of it. I think that's also something I was trying to get at a little bit. I mean, one of the things that from a Porticus perspective is we've been really trying to reframe um, evaluations to sort of learning partnerships so that you aren't um, 
uh, sort of doing the sort of uh, technical end line evaluation at the end, uh, but really built this together with uh, the with the with partners uh, and have them also have a say in who that learning partner actually ends up being um, and 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 creating a lot of space for that. So I think that that seems to I think help. I'm not sure that's that's the you know the the sort of silver bullet, but um, I, I'm sure there's a lot of different practices that we all have experience with that really do help. But I'm not sure we are um, you know making that a, a, a standard yet in the sector or really spending as much time on it. Yeah, I, and just building off that and really um, plus 100 to David. Uh, comment because I think it is something that especially in the last few years there's been rightfully so but such a focus on the who is doing the evaluation and I, I also think in for this conversation or another there could be a whole other conversation of of some of the over generalization of who is local who is global south who is representative of a community and funders also often over, you know, over correcting and just assuming that um, that everyone is the same in that context, which of course we all know there are power dynamics within every community and uh, a variety of different perspectives. And so really who is best positioned to do that, I think is another point that David, your comment just made me bring up, but also the, the, um, the transparency of the, and it's a little bit of what I was trying to say at the beginning of the the to what end for whom by whom the evaluation is being conducted and I think for you know for us at Ford to be um, very transparent the evaluations are because they're at a strategy level again at that portfolio level and they are they're done at a five-year point of a 10-year strategy and they're meant to inform our next five years of grant making they're meant to hold Ford accountable to some of the work that we've been doing and the assumptions inherent in how we were doing our grant making. The evaluation is primarily, the primary audience, and we try to make this clear in our, our, our RFPs, is Ford. We hope that as a secondary audience that our grantees will be able to use that field level perspective and take some of the learning and apply it to their work, but it is not, and we try to be explicit about that, um, you know, for, at, at a grant, it's not a grantee by grantee, it's not a project level evaluation. If our grantees are interested in monitoring and evaluating their own learning, I, that is a separate conversation that we have with program officers to be able to support them to either have the in-house capacity or to hire someone to do an evaluation of their own progress and to, to have the evaluant be them and to everything you're saying, David, to make sure that that is explicit and that that, that information is coming back to, to the communities they're working with. Um, but I think there's a, there's a transparency piece that also is sometimes glossed over that, again, we're, we're still on a journey and trying to be better about, but that it is important to be explicit about as much as we can. Thanks, Kelsey. And thanks for calling out um, some of the tendency to treat, you know, populations at a community level or city level as if they're heterogeneous, um, as if some of the same system dynamics, power structures aren't replicated and any place where we find humans around the world. So I really appreciate that point. Um, James, did you want to come in and respond to anything the panelists have said um, or offer some additional thoughts kind of from your side? Uh, sure, yeah, just to say that we, um, you know, we've, we've been increasingly like working either directly or, or with our um, with our partners um, with, you know, to um, to make sure that we're engaging like the implementation partners of the um, of, of the initiatives we're either evaluating or, or learning partners on. So I think that that's an area where we've seen kind of, you know, yeah, lo lots of progress. And, you know, back to David's question about who's who's using that, the decision makers there. But um, but yeah, where we've probably uh, been less able ourselves to see the kind of follow up from that is in like how that is then going that next level, how they are like engaging um, you know that the the people that they're working with as well um and you know reflecting that's you know obviously you know what possibly something that we can get better at in terms of thinking about that so yeah good food for thought
Well, thank you all. I am going to abuse my privilege as chair for just a moment to um, obviously note the dynamic here. We have two folks from funding institutions and two folks representing, you know, practitioner oriented um, institutions and sort of the evaluation architecture. You all touch on that in different ways. Um, so I wanted to just take a quick minute, uh, Marika, in your blog, you said, um, ideally, MEL becomes an integral part of philanthropic funded work, not an add on Underfund underfunded and administrative burden where outsiders ask questions and grant partners only supply answers. Um, and I would just love and, and Kelsey, there's some interest from the group in Ford's uh, equity scan of the evaluation field. So if I could ask maybe Marika and Kelsey just to talk a little bit about, you know, funders role and responsibility in some of these dynamics, um, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, would love to hear from both of you. You want to go first, Kelsey? I feel like I'm. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can go first. Um, so in terms of the, and please, Megan, do keep, I can't see the chat, so it's been loading the whole time, but please uh, keep bringing in the questions, uh, and apologies that I can't see everyone's um, questions. Um, but uh, in terms of the, in terms of the landscape scan that, um, that I mentioned earlier, and we do have uh, the evaluators, I think a couple of them on this call um, that are conducting that landscape, we are still in the early days of, of getting the results of of the scan. So I will just say that, um, unfortunately, I can't give you any answers yet <laughs> to the question. But I think in terms of what are funders' responsibilities, I mean, I think there is great responsibility. It's I think a lot of it starts and ends with the funder in terms of defining you know, what, is what funds are available to do an evaluation um, in the ways that we all think that they should be done by the people that we think should be doing them. And again, to a little the earlier point, how to change and adapt our own internal processes and bureaucracies to actually make it easier. Because I think that oftentimes we say, you know, we want to find evaluators that are from communities with lived experience to conduct these evaluations and then put up a whole lot of barriers in terms of the cost associated with it, the RFP process, the, you know, even some of the, the legal processes that are the realities of, of our institutions. And so how do you slowly chip away to, of, again, what we have control over and some of that we do and some of that we don't even internally um, to, to make some of those changes. And I think the landscape um, analysis is also trying to, to look at how do we as funders come together and move from a place of, of problem diagnosis, which I think is where we've been for a long time and recognizing there are these, these problems to, to action, to collective action um, in some ways, and also recognizing that each donor comes at it differently. I mean, I sit in a private philanthropy that has more leniency in some ways and, and more constraints in others than a bilateral or multilateral institution or a corporation or a different sort of, of philanthropy. So um, I think in all of this, it's, it's trying to think about um, fundamentally changing kind of who is uh, centered in decision making and programming um, and that doesn't mean that evaluation doesn't play a role within that, but it also doesn't mean that evaluation is the only place where that can happen. And so I think that's also something internally at Ford that we've been talking outside of our, within our unit, but outside of the evaluation space of those that are working with program officers and grant makers to think about, you know, how does that come in in the programming part? How does that come in in deciding um, who even gets a grant and what that work looks like? So it's, it's kind of a, a full cycle. Um, and, and us trying to continue to kind of push the envelope there. But um, I would say it, it, it is early days. And again, it, there are folks on this call with more experience of, of influencing um, and the best ways for advocacy at a donor level. Because I think we are, um, we're a big player in the private philanthropy space. We're a very small player in the evaluation space, <laughs> to be honest, um, because we don't conduct that many evaluations. Um, yes. And we're we're also very uh, very centered in a lot of our grant making happens in the U.S. Uh, compared to to our international work. So you know also recognizing and being quite humble of we as board and what we can do versus what and trying to use that power as much as we can and recognizing that of course uh, we are one tiny player in a very large ecosystem.
Yeah, thanks um, for the question, Megan. Um, I'm trying not to like repeat some of the things that I think we've said and maybe also connect uh, uh, and sorry, Kelsey here, I guess I have the added benefit of seeing the chat, but uh, some of the points that are being made in the chat. Um, of course, I, I I specifically like uh, what one of one of the um, participants wrote today is saying like we can't we can't fix through Mel if you know programs aren't being designed you know uh, in a way that really you know brings in um, lived experience and that really is uh, localized in the in the first place. So I think that is important to acknowledge. Um, but I guess at Porticus, what we've been trying to do is really find that moment. And I think this is where we've, we've, we've started to see that the engagement becomes sooner and sooner and sooner. It's like when, you know, like when you start to have the first initiatives and ideas around work to already bring um, a learning partner in, into that um, in a, in a, in a, and create space um, to, to talk about how some of these uh, responsibilities and, and tasks are being shared and uh, negotiated. And uh, to someone else's point, yes, maybe then you, uh, in, in, in an objective sense, you give up some, uh, some of the idea around um, independence. But I don't know, I feel like I do think the whole point around independence is being abused a lot uh, and, and doesn't always deliver the the value that that you can have I think being very close uh, and sort of following something closely I think I would value uh, often more over uh, uh, the sort of the, the the gold standard of independence but maybe that's a good discussion point uh, for others to come into um, and that maybe relates to the challenge I got from someone else, which is like, what is what are graceful ways to discuss power, right? And I think I do think you really need to create space and time to co-design. So that does show up in number of days, that does show up in budgets, uh, and uh, and I think that is something, especially for for funders and and in the RFP process to to consider. Uh, and I think something that we are we are trying to do, which is not easy, of course, you know, because uh, uh, yeah, you know, like the um, mail costs a lot of money and it, and and it often takes, you know, it feels like it takes away from the actual uh, programmatic work. So that I think is a is a tension. But there, I think if we are more selective, we can make sure we just um, free up uh, money for that of work. Um, and uh, I think there's other power structures that show up quite sort of hiddenly. We've seen like, for instance, massive discrepancies in fees between where people are based, which I think is really something we just shouldn't um, ex accept anymore. Um, and uh, and another part I want to throw in is, um, is I think that it requires better facilitation skills. So we talk a lot about sort of technical expertise, and this is something we focus on quite a lot. But what we see is that really great learning partners have very good facilitation skills to bring in uh, and have some of these difficult conversations and maybe talk about difference between partners and, and also with the learning partner. And I think that is an, uh, a skill set that I think is undervalued and that I think needs uh, more attention. And maybe I'll just leave it at that for now. Thanks, Marika. And thanks so much for referencing some of those soft skills um, that are important and crucial to helping promote the you know, transition to uh, locally led and locally informed MEL. Um, let me just quickly move over to David and James, and then I promise I'm going to ask you questions from the, the audience. Um, but James, in your blog, you touched on this idea that as practitioners, our main way of influencing the localization of MEL is through the teams that we convene to conduct our project work, the composition and leadership of those teams, who we partner with in our work, and how we partner with them. So, you know, I'd love to hear David um, from you and from James a little bit about, you know, thinking about that practitioner focused lens, you know, how do you, how can you commit to transitioning to strong locally led focus um, in, in evaluation work? What guidance might you offer? David, I don't know if you want to start. Okay, sorry. Well, you know, it, it's a, uh, it's a, uh... It's something that I have uh, started. Uh, currently, we have about 20 uh, uh, 
research grant, evaluation grants that were a grant from USA through uh, the Market Risk and Resiliency Innovation Lab, where for the first time in Innovation Lab, uh, Innovation Lab is a big grant that USA give to US universities to conduct impact evaluations on topics around the group. And it has been led by an American university's professors. But for the first time, you know, a portion of that grant was given to us. And solicitations were made. We, we received about 165 expression of interest, which were well down to about 125 full proposals from African researchers from African institutions. We did administrative review where we came to about 64, which went to peer review. So it was subject to rigorous review, you know, and out of that 28 were selected for funding. Because of funding limitation, we are currently funding about 12 of them with a minimum amount of $450,000 for three to five year period. And these are being done by Africa researchers in Africa research institutions from Ghana to Ethiopia. You know, but we did something that was interesting. We said, we don't mind if you can bring a global North mentor or somebody you have worked with, but they don't control the grants. So the Africa institutions are controlling the grants. Even when it comes to grant monitoring, we have three categories. We have African universities that have many big, large research grants. They were the first categories. They got the whole 450 and they are managing it and they account to us. We have institutions that have not managed such grants. We gave them quarterly disbursements and we have some of them that we do the disbursement from my office in Nairobi, from hiring data collectors to paying the researchers and everything because they don't have the capacity. But we are hoping that gradually these institutions will graduate to the second level and the third level. And these are grants, research grants that are being monitored. We have also commissioned evaluations from another horticulture innovation lab in East and West Africa. And currently we have about seven grants that are managing by Africa evaluators. So we have started, but it's a process from, it's not the technical know-how of just going to conduct the evaluation, but how do you manage the evaluation? How do you manage the evaluation results? How do you use the evaluation results to inform policy and action? So I have now started developing, we call it evidence-based decision-making products. I call it EBDMP. You know, we have established center of excellence in taking evaluation and developing evidence-based decision-making products like guidelines, like tools, like checklists, like protocol, like policy briefs, so that practitioners and policymakers can use it. So it's a process. And I think that if an organization like ATAD, we are working with them to, to build this capacity. You know, last, last, this year, last year, James was with me in, in Ethiopia, where we were in Uganda, where we were bringing researchers and evaluators and policymakers together to dialogue on effective way to use evaluate, evaluation fundings for decision making. So, it's a process that we are embarking on, and we hope that, you know, we will get to a point where, like a piano, I always use this thing as illustration, you know, like a piano. You cannot only play either white key or black key to make a melody. You know, for you to really, really have a good harmony, you have to learn how to use the combination of the white and the black. So we still need the combination of the white and the black the global north and the global south that can make a good melody that we all can dance. Thank you. <laughs>
Wow, David, I love that. Um, and thank you so much for talking about building out that pipeline of researchers and approaches. Um, I think that's really illustrative. And to our funders on the call, I hope we take note. Uh, it seems like David's uh, team is making great use of funds. So let's find him some more. Uh, thank you. James. <laughs> James, did you want to add anything to that? I know you got into this quite a bit in your blog post, but any kind of thoughts on this point? Um, yeah, a couple of things. So, um, yeah, again, just a, like a couple of things that have been mentioned around needing to you know, the time to be able to like build up these partnerships. Um, you know, if you are whether you know if you're going to be looking at, at global programs that's you know how how do you balance that you know it all takes time and the importance of of soft skills and creating the environments to to be able to do that and then you know share share between um different people um and then i think the the other area that um that's important and we are um, thinking through, but don't have the answers for again, um, and has come up quite a lot in, in I've seen in, in the questions, um, is around how you, you know, how, how you recognize power dynamics in a conversation at the beginning um, how, and how you, you talk through those and, um, and yeah, are aware of them. And you know, as we've spoken about this as an organization, it's something that um, that people have, have highlighted as, as something that, that you know, you can't just do. You, we, we need to like find, you know, find a way to, um, to be able to do it, and you know, like give people support to be able to do that. So, um, yeah, that that's just uh, again one of the things to to highlight um, that that we feel is is an important um, thing to to like tackle for long. I guess. Thanks so much, James. And I've seen that live with ITAD. I joined the board last year and I know that, you know, your team is really focused on the brass tacks of developing equitable partnerships. So really getting into the weeds of agreements and how you set them up and structure them, how you approach folks. So I've really appreciated your points on that front, James. Um, so I'm going to flip over to a few questions from the audience. They've been kind of coming in and thank big thank you to Neil who's helping me keep track of them. Um, so one and this one is from a for former colleague of mine at OSF, Sanjita, who asked about, you know, directional accountability in monitoring evaluation and learning. Um, so I, I think, you know, the typical directional accountability leading upwards often to funders um, and wondering about, you know, how that influences the dynamics and localization efforts. Um, and Sanjukta also asked, um, you know, how do you think about balancing the sort of need to know um, around impact without being extractive and just taking data and removing it from uh, communities. So, you know, I'd open it up to any of our panelists who might feel like they want to comment on that, that question. Okay, let me, let me talk about the accountability session. You know, uh, I teach a course on communicating m and &E results in the University of Ghana. And I always look at it from the point of view that, you know, at times we see evaluation, for, and I talk about it when I was talking about the sets role, that we do a program at the end of the program, we commission evaluations, we go there, we extract, and it's an accountability. The program did well, it achieved it goes or didn't achieve it goes. And, and that is the end. But when ideally when evaluation is planned, and I've seen a lot of questions, when evaluation, monitor and evaluation are in plan as part of the program, where everybody from the stakeholders to the program officers, to the program directors, to the program management, to the board, to the donors, are receiving different forms of uh, reports or information or data. Then evaluation move from being an accountable to being more of program, supporting program implementation, supporting accountability, supporting learning, you know, supporting knowledge sharing, and supporting program adjustments, you know. So, you, you you need to 
plan your MNG from the beginning for it to be useful. You know, and uh, I think uh, that our time is almost up, but one of the things that influenced my evaluation was reading Chambers' book, you know, la putting last in first. And when he said, whose reality counts, DS or ours? You know, and that book have been, you know, a golden thing in my evaluation as experience. Whose reality counts, DS or us? And when you talk about DS, you are talking about the beneficiary or the recipient or the client, right down to the program officer in the field, right down to the director, right down through the value chain of the intervention. You know, so you can move from accountability to more of a learning process when you integrate it from the beginning of the program. Thanks, David. Did any other panelists want to weigh in? Kelsey, I see you maybe searching for your mute button. <laughs> <laughs> You've learned how much of a Luddite I am on this call <laughs> and uh, yeah, how good I am at technology, which is not very good. Um, yeah, uh, I was just gonna um, and, and I agree with, with everything um, David said. It's hard to come after David with his very like beautiful prose, <laughs> um, uh, but I will try. Um, and I think just the, on the second question about um, the balance of needing to be what or thinking about what you need to know versus what you want to know, and and how to to balance impact versus being extractive. I mean, I think it's something we talk about a lot, and again, are still figuring out the right balance um, in our evaluations, I think it gets to kind of the whole conversation of, of what do we mean by equitable partnerships, but also localization and getting in community voice. I think for us, we try to, I mean, we use grantees often as a proxy, which we know there's a lot of challenges with of community voice again because of the the levels of evaluations that we do that are, are focused really across many many organizations um but even in thinking of how do you engage grantees without being extractive given that they have existing work going on and everything else and that this is going to be again secondarily helpful for them but mostly helpful for for us and i think that i mean we've tried to do it in a few different ways which is only trying to engage them in places where we feel like that the answers they give us will be useful for them and for us. So whether that's involved, should we be involving them at, at every single stage and, and being um, uh, asking them about design questions when we already know some of the questions that we have to answer and being transparent about what are the questions that we need to answer and what are the additional questions they would like answered um, to during the evaluation, also being cognizant of the time that they're taking. We've We've paid grantees um, for the time that they've taken du during an evaluation that is on top of the existing um, work that they're already doing um, and asking, you know, the best way in which they'd like to, to receive the information. And then at the end, I mean, none of these are uh, earth shattering, but making sure we're doing a webinar and dissemination and getting their feedback into the results of our evaluation um, and putting it on our website and trying to be transparent about those approaches. Um, and, and what we're finding. So, you know, I think that it is a challenge and it's a challenge when you think about wanting to ensure that there is the voice while also recognizing, I guess, it's again, it's the to what end. And so really being intentional and working with the evaluations, evaluators that we hire as well to think about what are the methodologies that are really needed? Do we, do we need a survey and interviews and something else? Or is that just kind of the go-to that everyone is used to in evaluations. Like, how will that actually be useful for the evaluation? And really, at each stage, trying to question our own assumptions and and get uh, grantee voice in as much as we can. And I think, I mean, to David's point about not just having it be a, a moment in time, I think it's also we try to use other sources of data other than just our grantees. So we have an internal grant management system that has a lot of information we can pull from. We have other surveys we've done of our grantees, the Center for Effective Philanthropy or others. So also trying to think about what are the existing information out there that we can pull from that doesn't also put so much burden on, on the grantees that we're working with. But um, 
after this, if you can send me the chat and, and if anyone has um, uh, advice or, or other ways that they've gone about it, I think it's something that um, we continue to try to work on and get better at. Thanks, uh, David and Kelsey. That was really helpful. I'm going to shift now, and Marika, you already brought up this question when you were responding to the panelists, but I was going to ask you and James maybe to come in on this one since you both addressed it in your comments. Um, from Alistair, we have, how can we gracefully talk about power um, in, you know, pursuing a localization agenda for Mel and bringing in new and different voices? Um, how do you go about having those conversations or maybe how do you think about that skill set required for having discussions on power? Um, so I, I don't know, Marika or James, who wants to jump in first, but over to you too. I can go first. Uh, so um, I think I hinted that I don't feel that we have the answer to this, Megan, but um, I can certainly um, say a little bit um, from my experience and, you know, that the, the, the need is just is just to be as open and honest as you can be around them. Um, and, you know, as as I mentioned, I recognise that 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 we I, I said we, we've not always done that and there are um you know there are some mitigating factors to that sometimes you're responding to something quickly you're pulling together a proposal or you're you know doing something and you can fall back into you know just getting straight into business so to speak rather than you know taking the step back trying to find the you know the ways that that a, a partner can or you know you can work with someone in a in a in a really equitable way and you know you can make the most of each other's um skills and experience and and find those areas so um yeah if anyone has the a, a really great framework to be able to do that then very interested but like but, but that yeah they're just some kind of thoughts from from experience yeah um megan i was already trying to I guess be a little bit more elaborate on this a little bit earlier because of course it's an easy thing to throw out there um, but actually how to do it is, is a different one. Um, if I just look at our experience there are a few things that as I said like actually really creating a lot of space for design uh, as, as sort of early on in the process as possible I think is very important uh, and, and really thinking about who is part of the design and uh, and also maybe the capacity of people to be part of that design phase, because that's often the the the, the area when that's sort of pre-grant. So that is also something that we're looking at internally and and started funding that uh, that sort of period. Um, um, I do, I mean, I, I do go on about this quite a bit. I do facilitation skills. I think it's really important. I think it's a real uh, art and science. And uh, and just to challenge you maybe a little bit back, Megan, I think those are actually, they're called soft skills, but I think they're super hard skills. Um, and, um, and it's something we sort of all think we can do and we can all do well. And I think that's, that's often, I think, a massive um, uh, underestimation. Um, so, in ha so having maybe also ways of, of, of uh, yeah, and, I, and, and, and then how do you really know, I think is of course hard. Uh, so that's maybe something we need to tackle a little bit more, but I think there's also um, ways to, to speak about this more openly or even just to trial uh, specific experiences and see if it works for everyone involved. Um, and then uh, I think some of the things that I think James also uh, alluded to in his blog, like really consciously thinking about who is being put into leadership positions in uh, in, in specific uh, teams. I think this is a dynamic that I think we also need to sh shift. Um, and I think some are already really doing great practice in this, but I think that is still the, the yeah rare in the sector. And the last thing I'll throw out, and maybe that's a little bit of a, um, an easy one to say as a funder, but I also think we need to um, challenge uh, each other more. And I think especially, and so maybe I'll just uh, give it as an invitation for those working with Porticus. I, I think 
sometimes we also unconsciously stick to certain ways of working. Maybe indeed it is also because of habit or speed, but I think um, challenge us on doing it differently and 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 sort of uh, be I think I guess bold in trying to take that that stage and just say like no you know we would rather do this differently or we would you know propose something else and I and I feel like often when that happens really great things happen um, but of course again because of those uh, power imbalances that doesn't always happen and I I think that we can all uh, yeah, step up a little bit and just maybe be a little bit more daring there. Thanks so much, Marika and James. I mean, you shared many different insights, but it sounds like part of it is it, maybe there isn't a perfect way of doing it. So, you know, trying and getting on with it and, and seeing what we learn along the way, it will be really valuable there. All right, panelists, I'm going to throw you two questions from two different audience members that are sort of interrelated, and let's see what you make of these. Um, the first is from Marina, um, who says, the question that I have beyond the challenge is that James mentions in his blog um, is how does localization fundamentally challenge one of the central quality criteria in evaluation, which is independence, um, which external evaluators hold on to tightly for good reason, perhaps, um, and commissioners still value. Are we ready to fundamentally rethink our identities and positionalities in the system? And a related question from Michelle, um, perhaps another important nuance for us to consider is roles. Are we moving towards a future in which we do not want any non-local evaluation team members at all? Or rather, do we want to get better at discerning when an external perspective would add value and then putting that external team member in a role that is supportive and responsive to local leadership? Are there other ways in which localization could be strengthened through changing the way we define roles? So uh, lots of themes touched on there, but really kind of challenging um, one of the core assumptions on, you know, needing to be external to a situation in order to effectively evaluate it. So um, let me see who wants to jump in first to tackle this beast. I can start because then I can pick one of the easier bits of it for me to do and then leave the rest for my panelists. So, <laughs> um, so um, on to, I'll start with uh, Marina's question, I think, about the um, independence element. And, and I think that, um, you know, we have, you know, I've, I've seen examples uh, in the past where part of, a, you know, a core team is someone who is as part of the core evaluation team is actually someone from the organization that we're um that's being evaluated or you know closer um you know than is not completely independent let's say or you know maybe um an organization i used to work for you know we, we had like you know who um members of staff who were from a different part of the organization for example so i don't think that i think there are really good examples when like complete independence is 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 not necessary. Um, I think that is always you know as long as you can always bring in evidence um, and you're making you know evidence based decisions and there are different ways to do that. Then, um, then I think that there are certainly grayer areas and part of the the point of having a utilization focus to an evaluation is to bring in the the ideas and you know constraints that the people making the decisions wherever they're based um you know so yeah you're taking that into account so yeah so i would say that there is yeah gray area you know i would like to come here megan uh, i lost a very very high independent evaluation unit job because during the interview i i told the panel that evaluation should be part of the program from inception and one of the 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 evaluators asked me so how can you be independent when you are part from the beginning and i said yes Evaluation is not value judgment. Evaluation is judging judgment of value. So the mere part that ideally MNE should start from the beginning, ideally evaluation should be continuous, you know, through the program in, in implementation. 
and ideally, uh, evaluation should bring evidence of failures and success, doesn't mean that it cannot be independent. You know, and at times when we talk about independent, we think about somebody coming to pass judgments. No, evaluation is not passing of judgments. It's judging the value, the merits, and significance of what has been done so that we can use it to inform the program, to improve the program. Why do you wait and be independent when millions of dollars have already been spent? And maybe it's a failure. So coming to tell me my program failed at the end of the project, what have you done to me? Why, if you have integrated it from the beginning, cost of collections could have been done. You know, I will have done, learned something. I will have seen, you know, when you look at the metrics, you know, when you take inputs, if input are achieving output, we said the program is effective. When, when, when output are meeting objective, this we said the program the program is efficient. You know, so why don't you do it continuously, so that at the end of the day we can make collections, we can change, we can inform program managers, we can even still uh, provide the accountability function to tell the donors what is going on. Why do you want to finish after five years before you come and say you are an independent evaluator? That is a myth. You can still be an independent evaluator and be part of the program when you are doing judgment of value instead of value judgment. And sorry, I would just also like to add uh, that um without wanting to take us down a method little route, but um, just to say that, um, of course, there are some some methods that are blurring those lines a little bit. For example, um, we're currently doing um, a strategy level developmental evaluation uh, for Laudus. Um, and within that, you know, we're those you know we're, we're, those lines are intentionally blurred we spend, we spend a lot of time with with the team and working together in collaboration so um yeah uh, 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 just to further add to david's point yes yeah, just to just to come in a little bit i did formative evaluation you know doing the baseline you know the program was designed before we did the baseline so the targets and, and, and the cost of intervention were set during the design stage. When we did the baseline and we did the dissemination of the baseline information, targets were revised. You know, even program designs were changed. During the midterm evaluation, when we, we shared the results, program adjustments were, were made so that at the end of the project, you know, based on the baseline, based on the midterm, you know, we didn't really, really find any significant because all these things have contributed to the final evaluation. So, you know, it's not the program people who did the baseline, it's the MNG unit that did the baseline, but still the baseline information was used to adjust targets. The midterm evaluation was used to do cost of collections. So it contributed to effective and efficient implementation of the program. Yeah, I couldn't agree more on that. So I'll be brief because I think um, it, it has been said and, and thanks for being so eloquent uh, on this, David. I think um, when you say it's not to pass judgment, I think that is a key aspect because um, this is also what we are trying to grapple with internally. How do you really shift to the learning, you know, like being accountable to learning instead of this sort of accountability to how essentially how funds are spent. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, like that is is a is is quite a difficult practice shift and it shows up in different ways right so we're also really looking at sort of our reporting forms you know like you know how can we really shift the reporting form to 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 learning and then you don't you probably don't even really need a reporting form um and uh and and make 
those practices less uh, burdensome. But but I think that that framing, I think, is really important. And then if people feel part of that, it becomes easier to really have those uh, discussions. And what I've seen in my personal experience is like people close to it are often far more uh, sort of critical and uh, have very high standards for you know because they care and they want you know they want these programs to work and they want to really make change and uh so you know like w what is the independence then for you know like i think that that is i think uh, what is a little bit mind-boggling like people internally really want it to work and i think they will be far more critical uh, um, of, of their own work often because uh, because of that intrinsic motivation. So it's also about how you then create that, um, that starting point. <clears throat> Thanks so much to um, the three of you for responding to that tough question. Um, I really appreciate the reflections as somebody who's been an internal evaluator for most of my career. David, your comments on the role of those folks as crucial was really, really helpful. Um, I want I want to make sure we get to Michelle's question around, um, you know, do we see a future in which there are no non-local evaluators who are part of an evaluation team? And let me underscore it with another question we have. I think also. Oh no, I'm sorry, that was from Michelle, and this one is from Melanie. Um, Melanie asked um, about, you know, what are what ideas do we have about, you know, how to integrate. Um, local insights and perspectives in the context of evaluating a global program. And I think, Kelsey, this really was meant to touch on your points in particular about, you know, for doing these portfolio level evaluations, which are taking place across many regions, uh, countries, et cetera, um, and really trying to sort out what does it mean to about having uh, local evaluators um, in that context. So Kelsey, I might hand this over to you first, but then I'd also welcome other panelists to come back on this point about, you know, what does the future look like for an evaluation team? Sure, um, and thanks for the question. I mean, I think it's something that um, is probably the one we talk about the most often. And I do just want to make a distinction between doing a portfolio level evaluation of a global program where the intervention is one related to public health or agriculture or um, education, which is um, not what Ford does in terms of, of the work that we support. So it's it's the portfolio aspect that is one piece of it, but it really is the type of the type of work our grantees are doing that is the other piece of it, which really is I keep saying advocacy and policy work, but it is mostly advocacy and policy work. So I think that's also just a different um, types of questions that you are asking in, in different ways of engaging. And none of this, I hope, is coming off as, as an excuse because it's not an excuse to, to not engage. Um, it just means that the questions we ask and, and how we think about it are a little bit different. Um, and I think that I started touching on it before, but for now, what we've done is really used our grantees as a proxy for the local communities of which they are supposed to be advocating on behalf and for. Um, recognizing that often the questions are about what worked or what didn't in this advocacy campaign to get this policy passed. And then once the policy passed, what worked or didn't to implement the policy. And to be honest, a lot of the work is is more at the getting it passed versus the, the implementation phase or getting a collective of organizations together to create a, a stronger voice in um, advocating for a social justice issue. Um, and with that, I think we've been working with um, with our grants making effectiveness officer internal to Ford and thinking about and it gets a little bit to David's point of this should be baked into the very beginning of when we're first talking to grantees and seeing if if they're the right support for Ford, what is their connection to community? What is their makeup in terms of representation from the community? How are we making sure that they are actually um, continuing to be in those conversations before we even invite a proposal and start a relationship. And again, that is a, a work in progress, but it it can't start with the evaluation um, as the first time in, in which we think about it. And so I think we're trying to think about it in terms of the whole life cycle of, of a grant um, and thinking about what that looks like, but it is definitely an imperfect um, solution. And I think 
with some of our programs that do work a little closer to community, we've been able to, to get there um, by talking directly. For example, we just did an evaluation of our arts program in the US and we fund organizations that support artists, but we also fund the artists themselves. And we were able to speak to the artists in that situation. For, for usually how our programs work. So um, it's something we're still working on and, and grappling with, but that's kind of where we've landed internally. Thanks, Kelsey. We have time for one more panelist to give a very quick high level response. And David, I'm going to ask you if you want to come in, um, particularly on this question about, you know, local perspectives and ownership in global programs and or, you know, the future of evaluation teams, um, having folks who aren't necessarily local to the situation or challenge being a part of them. So whatever you make of those well, two, I invite you to share. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, let me let me talk about it. I talk about the piano where for you to make a good melody, you need both the white and the black keys, you know, in order to do. I've worked in both worlds. You know, I've spent time working in Donor World, working in USAID Millennium Challenge Corporation, and I've spent time working in AGRA, which is an Africa-based organization. And uh, I've spent time now for six years, you know, uh, running uh, Africa-based, African-led monitoring and evaluation think tank. I don't think there will be a point where you can say that, you know, evaluation, monitoring and evaluation can be done by only local people. Funders have fiduciary responsibility to their task makers, task payers, to be accountable to their past task payers. When I worked for Millennium Challenge Corporation, I go to US Congress to defend the investment, you know, that they are making. So, you know, you need me in your evaluation team to protect my taxpayers' interests. So as much as I need you to bring in the contextualized, you know, value into it and your understanding of the program, I need the other view. And when we bring the two views or the three or the four viewpoints together, then the evaluation answers the question you know, of utilization. So utilization of evaluation function is not one way. It's both, it, it cuts across. So as much as the donors will also want to know did the program work or is the program working, the beneficiaries also wants to know is the program working. So everybody benefits. So the movements, you know, and that is where the question of power and all these things comes in. At the, at the end of the day, how do we see, I did an uh, evaluation with ATAD. They are based in England, I'm based in Nairobi, but I was the team leader. It, it was the two organizations that were contracted. And I was, my organization were the lead organization. You know, so we are moving from a stage where we have sub recipients you know, or sub awardee to partnership. So I would like to work with a northern based institution like ATAD, you know, as a partner, not as a sub awardee, you know, where both of us have equal stake into the final report of the evaluation. Thank you. Thanks so much, David, and thanks for underscoring that example um, of your partnership with IATAD. Unfortunately, folks, I think we could keep talking, but our time has concluded for today's panel. Um, I want to give a huge, huge thank you to David, Marika, James, and Kelsey for joining us and offering their really interesting thoughts and perspectives. A huge thank you to all of you who participated in the chat um, and who attended today. Um, Please share your views on today's events. Um, you know, follow up with us at ITAD, send us messages on the blogs, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, wherever you want to feed in. And please join us for our next one of these panel discussions where we'll be exploring new technical innovations in MEL for systems change on March 29th. Uh, we hope to see some of you there and look forward to continuing this conversation. Have a great week, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.